Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Mike Kramer, uh, Calibration Program Manager at the Perry Johnson Laboratory Accreditation. And I'd like to uh, welcome you all to uh, this month's uh, webinar provided on behalf of PJLA. And uh, as you can see, the uh, title of this one is uh, 17025 Measurement Uncertainty. It's going to be a general overview, it's just some of the highlights. Uh, some of the requirements in regards to uh, uncertainty, uh, the basics to putting together an uncertainty budget, uh, uh, quantifying uh, measurement uncertainties, they have the different types of distributions. Again, as always, uh, this uh, specific webinar is being uh, recorded. I realize that uh, you know, this is a, a bad week uh, with the uh, Thanksgiving holiday and uh, um, may not uh, um, been able to attend because of that. Uh, however, as always, um, uh, this one's being recorded and will be available on our website in its entirely um, uh, when we're finished here. So if you knew somebody who uh, wanted to attend and uh, could not, uh, please direct them to our website. So measurement uncertainty. Um, I want to start out by just looking at traceability uh, and how uh, measurement uncertainty is entwined in traceability. So from the vocabulary of international metrology, as you can see, definition of metro uh, metrological traceability, property of a measurement result, whereby the result can be related to a reference through a document, an unbroken chain, of calibration, each contributing to the measurement uncertainty. Hence, by definition, uh, any laboratory who is claiming that their measurements are traceable would have to have an uh, uncertainty associated with that specific measurement. So uh, I got the, uh, the, the link there, and uh, you see NIST at one end and that commercial lab at the other. So with each one of those links, and ideally, uh, the better to pick this, uh, each link would get larger as you get away from NIST because uh, each uncertainty is going to build upon the other. Uh, so each link has an associated uncertainty. Each uncertainty with each link will increase the further you get away from the origin. In this case, it's actually uh, to the SI through NIST. Hence, a broken link may be an instance, for example, that the measurement uncertainty was not estimated for that calibration and thus traceability stops at that point. That's why it's uh, important when we're doing assessments and our assessors are, are in uh, typically calibration labs that's specifying uh, measurement uncertainty we're looking at uh, your uncertainty. We're looking at uh, uh, where your standards were calibrated. We're looking at the uncertainty from there and seeing in, if, in fact, uh, your uncertainty will be uh, built upon uh, from the, um, the lab that you received your uncertainty from. Measurement uncertainty. So what is it? In the field of calibration and testing, measurement uncertainty, expanded uncertainty, defines the boundaries that displays from the measurement result, which are expected to contain the true value of measured and to some confidence level, typically 95%. Although the measure result is uncertain, by the stated amount, the area, area, the area established between these boundaries can be thought of as a zone of certainty. So uh, very basic here, assume a calibration procedure, uh, excuse me, a calibration produces a measurement result of X with an uncertainty of plus or minus Y. Hence, all that can be stated with a reasonable level of confidence, typically 95% in most cases, is that the true value uh, and measures lies between x plus y, y being the uncertainty, and x minus y.
OK, I'm going to look at uh, some of the requirements uh, with uh, um, uncertainty. And uh, I'm going to look at right now uh, some of the requirements right out of 17025. And at the end of this presentation, and those of you who have been uh, um, at the, my last few presentations on these webinars, I'm going to look at some of the uh, differences. Um, that's coming down the pipe, basically, because uh, if you're not aware of it, standards going to be revised. It looks like it's going to happen um, uh, at the end of this month, if not, no later than uh, than the end of December. Um, but uh, currently, we're still operating off of uh, 17025, 2005, uh, 5461. A calibration lab or a testing lab performing its own calibration shall have and apply a procedure to estimate the uncertainty that measurements for all calibration and types of calibration. So one thing you're going to see different, uh, and this is uh, with the uh, entire revision of the standard, um, uh, you still have to be able to determine uncertainty, but the requirements of having an actual procedure um, is slimmed down quite a bit in the new standard. Uh, primarily because we've gone uh, from paper to electronic. So uh, oftentimes uncertainty is a methodolog methodologically of entering data into the computer, looking up data, things like that. Uh, one thing in 5461 is specifies testing labs. So um, if you're a testing lab and you're performing your own calibrations, Let's say, for example, you have uh, analytical balances and you decide um, I am going to just calibrate these in house. Um, that's what we're talking about here. So if you're performing your own calibration to, to support your testing at PJLA, we call this in house calibration. You too have to have a procedure and estimate the uncertainty for this measurement. 5462, and this is an abbreviated form of uh, what's in the standard. Testing lab shall have and apply a procedure uh, for estimating uncertainty of measurements and shall ensure that the form of reporting of the result does not give a wrong impression of the uncertainty. And uh, we're going to look at this a little further as we capture it in uh, PL3, which is our policy, PGI's policy for uh, measurement uncertainty. 5463. Um, when estimating the uncertainty of measurement, all uncertainty components which are of importance to a given situation shall be taken into account uh, using appropriate methods of analysis. In other words, all the significant contributors have to be included. And uh, at 510.42, uh, that is reporting the results. And one thing I did leave out here is um, uh, when you're, you need to either report the actual uncertainty and or a statement of compliance um, with uh, your reporting of the results. Uh, we do specify in PL3 some of the uh, requirements when you have to report uncertainty. And if you don't report uncertainty, what needs to be in place? But basically what this is saying when make, making a statement of compliance, uh, that is when you say something pass fails, intolerance, out of tolerance, um, that uh, you have to actually take the measurement uncertainty into account prior to making that statement. Uh, still on 17025, test reports where relevant, a statement of compliance, non-compliance with requirements and or specifications. Again, with that, when you're making a statement of compliance with the testing lab, you too will have to, to uh, look at the, the uncertainty and uh, basically take that into account. Um, where applicable, a statement on the estimated uncertainty of measured, of measurement information on the uncertainty is needed in test reports when it is relevant to the validity or application of the test results, when a customer instruction so requires, or when the uncertainty affects compliance to a, spec to a specification limit. Uh, 
Okay, here we got some requirements. It's actually, uh, these are from ILAC, which is uh, International Laboratory Accreditation Cooperation. So hence, uh, these are policies that uh, the accrediting bodies under the ILAC uh, Mutual Recognition Agreement ha have to uh, assure that it's uh, being uh, applied to the laboratories under those. Hence, PJLA is a ILAC signature, hence a P document is a policy document as those policies become our policy. So uh, a couple highlights from here. Uh, uncertainty re resulting from re repeatability must be included in the estimate, i.e. you have to include re a repeatability as a component to your uncertainty. Regardless of the report and option chosen, if the unit on your test will be used to perform further calibration, the uncertainty must always be reported. Hence, um, and this is something that needs to be determined during contract review. If your device is going to be used to calibrate other devices, then the uncertainty has to be reported. And if you recall the definition of traceability, um, that will need to be on the, those calibration reports. Um, the uncertainty must never be reported at less than the CMC. CMC is calibration and measurement capabilities. Used to be BMC, best measurement capabilities, for the ability of the laboratory to perform the calibration. So a CMC is, uh, for example, when you look on a accrediting uh, body's website, look at calibration. You'll typically, and we'll see some examples here, uh, we'll have a range with CMCs. Those CMCs are the uh, calibration and measurement capabilities of the organization. The uncertainty shall never be reported at more than two significant digits. Got parentheses calculator available there. And actually uh, on our website under our resource tabs, we have some calculators. And one of them is a, a uh, calculator that will actually um, reduce the values to two significant digits. Okay, uh, PL3, that's uh, PGLA's uh, policy for uh, measurement uncertainty. Uncertainty analysis is to be documented in an uncertainty budget. So, and what is this? This is typically the process of identifying uncertainty components, quantifying those components, combining those components, then expanding those components. Um, the laboratory must define the manner in which the uncertainty is accounted for when making statements of compliance with specifications. Um, again, that resorts back to uh, taking measurement uncertainty into account uh, when when making those statements. And uh, uh, we do specify in PL3 that uh, if you do not take it into a, if you do not address it in your own uncertainty procedure, then we would require you, you do it as stated in PL3. Three, where we have a couple examples of uh, phrases that can be used on the calibration report, or you can simply use the term pass and determine it, fail and determine it. Uncertainty for calibration performs in CMC as it appears on the scope of accreditation must be estimated by the same methods. And uh, lastly, uh, uh, still in uh, PL3 here. Uh, uncertainty is not a one-time thing. It's not something you start out, you develop your budgets, and then you leave them alone. Um, upon achieving accreditation, the uncertainty budgets and the decision regarding resources of uncertainty shall be periodically reviewed and updated by the organization to reflect changes in the organization, its equipment, procedures or personnel that might influence the ability of the organization to perform specific calibrations or tests for which they are accredited. These changes shall be documented. Additionally, for calibration organizations, CMC shall be recalculated based on any changes to the related uncertainty budgets or to underlying information contained with them. This information must provide, be provided to the PJLA assessor during Subsequent surveillance and reaccrediting assessments or to PGLA staff upon request. So, what we're saying here is um, 
every time you have your standards recalibrated, for example, um, that needs to be reviewed to see if there's any uh, specific changes. Um, even if you move your facility, you're in a different different location. Uh, maybe for the better, maybe for the worse, but uh, uh, repeatability studies would need to be done to determine if there was a change in, in that. And of course, if you change your standards or equipment, um, uh, perhaps make upgrades, uh, those two would uh, correlate to uh, the uncertainty budgets being reviewed and the CMCs to, uh, co to uh, correlate to the uh, changes in equipment. The calculation of CMCs is an effort to express the smallest uncertainty which an organization can obtain when performing the more or less cal routine calibration of a nearly ideal device under nearly ideal conditions. So again, we, we sort of already specified what a CMC is. It's another name, it's another name basically for stating it is an uncertainty, but it is the best uncertainty that the uh, lab can produce. You can always report an uncertainty higher, uh, but can never report an uncertainty lower than what's stated on the CMCs. Uh, I have a sample of uh, one of our scopes here. Just wanted to uh, go over a, a, require a um, excerpt from PL4, which is our scopes of accreditation. Uh, CMCs can be expressed on the scope of accreditation as a relative uncertainty equation. So. Uh, on this particular uh, example of uh, a scope, you see some uh, CMCs that are expressed as fixed points and some that are expressed as an equation. So a relative uncertainty equation, for example, is a uh, calibration from, uh, if you look at that first one, from a micrometer, uh, 0 0.01 to 20 inches, that uh, you would cal calculate it at the low end. You want to calculate it at the high end. Ideally, you would want to calculate it uh, also somewhere in the middle. And if the uh, relationship is linear, then you can express it in an equation format, such as uh, which is uh, expressed in these relative uncertainty equations. Couple terms here: uh, accuracy and precision. Accuracy is the closeness of a measured measurement or a set of observations to a true value. The higher accuracy, the lower the error. Precision is the closeness of multiple observations to one another or the repeatability of the measure measurement. So that's the verbal term. Uh, going to depict it a little bit uh, here, uh, which is probably a clearer indication of a uh, precision and accuracy. Um, so here we got the four targets. Um, top left, not accurate or precise. You have your values, they're, they're all over the place. They're not close to each other, each other, and they're not, uh, not near the target either. Top right uh, is precise but not accurate. Uh, so in this particular case, we're hitting a target but we're not hitting the right target. So often this is the, the one thing with uh, folks doing repeatability as a uh, internal measurement assurance program. Sure, it's gonna show that you can repeat, but you also need to assure that you're repeating the right thing. Ah, uh, bottom left, we're accurate, but not precise. We're kind of close to the target, but we're still, still spread out. Uh, bottom right. Um, this is where ideally everybody wants to be. We're precise, we're accurate. We're hitting our target and we're hitting it consistently. So steps in the um, steps necessary in developing an estimate uh, of measurement uncertainty. Step one uh, is identify. We're going to make a list of all equipments or conditions that diminish the correctness of the measured results. 
We're going to identify those sources of uncertainty. Secondly, we need to assign a value or we have to quantify. So we have to determine reasonable values for the standard uncertainty for each identified contributor. Okay, so we've identified uh, components, we've, we've uh, quantified them, we're now going to combine them. So we're going to combine all of our standard uncertainty, typically using the RSS or root sum of squares methods. And then finally, we're going to take that combined uncertainty, we're going to expand them. We're going to multiply it by the appropriate coverage factor to obtain the expanded uncertainty of the measurement results. So measurement uncertainty, why does it occur? So uh, I have a list of uh, various things here. A random variation in the measurement process. Systematic variation in the measurement process. Limited resolution of the measurement and test equipment where applicable. Limited resolution of UUT, unit under test, um, where applicable. We can have biases of the uh, measurement and test equipment or the unit under test. Repeatability error of the unit under test. We can have uh, influences uh, by the uh, folks or personnel that are, are taking the measurements. You can have an uh, operator or technician induce variations. Um, operation or te technician induce biases. Uh, for the last one, I'd like to give the example of if you're familiar with uh, reading a, uh, a precision flask where you're reading the meniscus and somebody, some folks will constantly see the meniscus perhaps a little bit higher or a little bit lower than uh, what others are seeming or reading it as. Uh, that would be considered a bias. So we have uh, measurement system influences on UUT. And again, unit that's unit under test. So these are the uh, the artifacts that are being calibrated. So you can have distortion produced by the measurement process. You can have distortion produced by work holding the device. Uh, some devices are very sensitive to changes. Um, I remember I was doing an assessment once and. Uh, watching someone calibrate one of these devices, they were putting it down and holding it on their, their knee uh, between readings. And hence, uh, I'm thinking to myself, well, that's, uh, that's definitely introducing a, uh, a uh, distortion of that device, uh, uh, heating up the element. Uh, we have environmental influences. So typically these are things that include uh, temperature, so uh, typically with a lot of the dimensional with different metals, we have thermal expansion of the measurement and test equipment in the unit under test uh, that uh, reacts different to different temperatures. Um, it's uh, the thermal expansion and the temperature effects there. Temperature gradients in the laboratories. Uh, I have a well controlled lab. However, you have temperature gradients in there, temperature differential. So, uh, it, you might have it, uh, uh, depending on uh, how tight your controls are on your lab, it's going to uh, determine um, how great of an influence this is. So where you're sitting, where you're doing the testing, where your uh, uh, standard, where your device unit on your test, uh, they're in the same lab, but uh, due to temperature gradients, there could be uncertainty associated uh, in regards to that. Humidity, uh, increase in density, moisture, content, physical properties. Barometric pressure, variation in gas, volume, vapor pressure may affect uh, different types of uh, calibration. Uh, in all three of those, temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, anybody that's doing any calibration where you have to take the air buoyancy into effects, uh, 
each one of those are, are figured into those uh, that equation. And so you would have an uncertainty associated with each one of those. Local values or uh, uh, acceleration due to gravity. Hence, uh, uh, we have different uh, forces uh, depending on where we are or altitude that uh, may have an influence on our measurement. Same with the unit under test, uh, distortion produced by gravitational effects on the unit under test. So uh, measurement uncertainty, uh, the methods for determining a measurement uncertainty have been divided into two generic classes. And uh, typically you hear these as type A and type B. The type A evaluation is produced, uh, produces a statistically uh, determined uncertainty based on a normal distribution. These are typically those uh, uh, contributors that are associated with repeatability. Type B evaluation represents uncertainty determined by any other means. So most uncertainties that were formerly called random uncertainty will be treated as type A uncertainties. This is because we use those underlying statistical models to estimate them. Most uncertainties formerly called systematic uncertainties will be treated as type B uncertainties. This is because a symptomatic error does not have any variability and thus it cannot be analyzed with statistics. I think a little uh, closer look here at type A. These are the statistical uncertainty and they may be based on any valid statistical measurement method uh, for treating data. Examples of uh, or calculate the standard deviation of a mean of a series of independent observation using the method of least squares to fit a curve to data in order to estimate the parameters of the curve and their standard deviations and carry out an analysis of variance in order to identify and quantify random effects in certain kinds of measurements. Carrying out the same measurement operations many times and calculate the standard uh, deviation of the attained value is one of the most common practices in measurement uncertainty. Uh. So for type A analysis with only a small number of samples, i.e. readings, um, the standard coverage factor is insignificant to ensure that the expanded uncertainty covers the expected confidence interval. The more the samples, the more samples that you collect, the more the data will begin to resemble a normal distribution. After calculating the mean and standard deviation, you need to determine the dis degrees of freedom associated with your sample sets. Degrees of freedom, what is that? Um, that's basically the number of samples or readings that you're getting minus one. Uh, the usage of a student T distribu distribution will be used to determine the confidence interval or the K factor. Now, the K factor, where does that come from? You see that often on uh, calibration uh, reports. Uh, calibration was uh, uncertainty is based on uh, 95% confidence interval with a K factor of two. And uh, that is obtained from what we have up here now is a student T table. So uh, for example, uh, you can see uh, we got one sample set. We have uh, at a 95% uh, confidence interval just based on one, we're gonna have to use a coverage factor of 12.7 approximately. You see, as we get closer to 20 and move on down, we're, we're, we're pretty consistent. We're coming close to, uh, and we're not fluctuating much around a, a K equals two as our 95% confidence interval. So that's where your uh, K factor comes from, is uh, from the student T table and your confidence interval based on uh, what you're stating. Like I said, most folks in the calibration, sometimes we see them at uh, 99%. 
but, uh, but more often than not, 95%, which is highlighted there in the red. Well, realistically, repeatability uncertainty is typically based on a small sample size. Accurate per parameters or underlying normal distribution cannot be predicted on the basis of a small sample size. So how do you adjust for the effects of small sample size? Uh, you may have heard of uh, an equation called the Welch satellite formula. And what this does, it adjusts your degrees of freedom and your coefficient of sensitivity for all your contributors. So, don't have the time here to go into to great detail. I just wanted to uh, to uh, bring this to light, uh, show this equation, introduce you if you're not already familiar with the uh, the Welsh satellite saddle weight formula to uh, adjust for the effects of small sample size. So. Uh, we're talking about small samples. We're talking about normal distributions. So basically, uh, what we're trying to ascertain is uh, what we have depicted on this screen here. The uh, basically what we have is a lot of of uh, uh, samples within a population. So uh, typically, uh, they're not uh, uh, falling in suit with the population standard deviation. Uh, we are attempting through the uh, well satellite formula is to adjust these to more look like a normal distribution. Okay, so uh, that's uh, that's uh, um, type A evaluation, type B evaluation, the evaluation of uncertainty by means other than statistical. So often these are things that are given, uh, they're, they're assigned. Uh, it could be based on previous measurement data, could be based on knowledge of behavior or properties of material and instruments, could come from manufacturer specifications, uh, could come from data provided in calibration and other reports, i.e. that comes from uh, your, your uh, standards and equipment that you're using. If you're having those calibrated, you get a calibration report for those. Uh, typically, you don't have a calibrate yet, no uncertainty on those reports. Uncertainty assigned to reference data taken from handbooks. So generally, and I like to call them the big three when I'm looking at budgets, I'm always looking for these three components. Uh, you're always going to have your uncertainty due to your standard, i.e., you know, that's the traceability. Where is, where is your standards calibrated? And there's an associated uh, um, uncertainty associated with that. Typically, you need to look, and like I said, most of the time, these are uh, a K factor of K equals 2. You need to assure that uh, that is, in fact, the case because that's going to, to uh, affect how you quantify that particular component is for uncertainty. Uh, we just went over, you're gonna have uncertainty due to repeatability. If you recall at ILAC P14, you're required to, uh, to include that in your uncertainty estimation. And then uh, we're always gonna have typically uncertainty due to limited res resolution of the device under test. So what I've depicted here, if you could sort of imagine a, uh, say a rigid rule and these are the graduations in it where we can definitely see uh, 0 0.0002, let's say these are inches, and 0 0.0003 inches. That's the, the resolution that we can actually see. However, in reality, there, there are, you can divide those up into uh, uh, smaller uh, divisions. Uh, so the value could actually lie between, uh, and it typically will lie between one of those, uh, the actual resolution that you can see on the device, hence you have an uncertainty associated with it. All right, 
going to talk about distribution and distribution types. And this is something that uh, when we quantify our uh, uncertainties, uh, we have to figure out what type of distribution that they're going to entail. So typically, like we stated before with repeatability, is typically based on a, a normal distribution where we have 95% of our values fall between minus two and plus two sigma of the uh, actual mean. So that is defined by the mean and the standard deviation. So this is frequently encountered in uncertainty analysis. Second type of uh, distribution, these are uniform or rectangular. So these are not fully defined by the mean in the standard uncertainty. Population has finite boundaries and all elements have an equal probability of occurrence. These are things that are given. These are things that aren't going to change. For example, what we just looked at, the resolution device under test, that's uh, typically going to be a rectangular distribution. It is what it is. It's not going to change. It's uh, going to uh, uh, have uh, that uh, value uh, repeated no matter how many times you look at it. And again, I'll uh, specify up here our, our divisor for a rectangular distribution is a square root of three. And a typical rule of thumb is if you're not sure what type of distribution something falls into, chances are it's going to fall within a rectangular distribution. Um, triangular distribution, uh, not fully defined by the means and the standard uncertainty. Population has finite uh, boundaries and elements near the center and have probability of uh, occurrence. So the way I like to co uh, uh, correlate a triangular distribution is a, if you have a, a heating and cooling system in your lab and you have something that's called center driven, which means and uh, some of your better control facilities have a center driven system and uh, where if you have your set point, whatever that happens to be, that's where the heat and cooling that will uh, fight up. Well, not fight is probably not not a good word, but uh, but operate in conjunction with each other. So you're constantly having a change there between heat and cooling right at the set point. Uh, it's a, a center driven system. And uh, a U distribution. So uh, it's not fully defined by the Bs and the standard uncertainty. We have, uh, there's our uh, divisor there. As population has finite boundaries and elements near the boundaries have a higher uh, probability of occurrence. So again, going to my, uh, my uh, heating and cooling and temperature, uh, distribution there. You have uh, other ones that are called boundary driven heating and cooling system. So for example, if you have your uh, lab set at 20 degrees C plus or minus two degrees C, it's going to start uh, uh, changing as it gets closer to the boundary, i.e. if it gets as it approaches 20 point two or 19 point eight that's when the uh, heating and cooling elements are going to come into play so uh, what standard uncertainty has been determined for all components using a type a analysis they are combined into a total standard uncertainty the combined uncertainty for the resultant measurement quantity using the root sum of squared methods, which uh, yes, the uh, equation that's depicted there where each one of those use is a standard uncertainty, uh, UC being the combined. So that's the method of combining the uncertainty, RSS or the root sum of squares. 
So uh, typically, measurement uncertainties are expressed as an expanded uncertainty. So as basically, we talked about the K factor, confidence interval, uh, our expanded uh, our expanded uncertainty is our K times what we got here in our combined. Hence, we get an expanded uncertainty. Our K is the coverage factor. Coverage factor of K equals two is typically used representing a 95% confidence that the measure value is within the specification uh, specified measurement uncertainty. Reporting of expanded uncertainty must it, must it include both the uncertainty value and either the coverage factor or confidence interval in order to assure proper use. All right, I did pull from my archives here samples of some budgets, so the certainty budgets. Uh, um, here we have a, a sample of a dimensional micrometer uh, uh, uncertainty budgets. And you see on uh, this one, we have those big three I refer to. We have the uncertainty of the standard, uncertainty of the repeatability, uncertainty due to limited resolution. We also have that non-standard temperature where we're talking about temperature gradients. Uh, typically, uh, uh, temperature uh, is adjusted uh, at, say, perhaps 20 degrees C. So we have uh, taken measurements, we're adjusting from there, so we have an uncertainty there. As we have the uncertainty associated with the actual thermometer, and we have uncertainty due to differential temperature. I'm sorry, differential temperature is uh, in regards to uh, the gradients in the lab, and non standard temperature is the temperature difference uh, from the uh, what we're adjusting the, the uh, calibration temperature to be made at. Here's a uh, uh, torque type uh, calibration. Those of you folks that are in torque or anything electronics, uh, one thing that's in here is manufacturer specifications. Uh, what that is, it's uh, typically the drift. Typically, that's the drift from calibration to calibration. So, uh, uh, typically, that's something that, that you can obtain. And after you have so many calibrations, uh, uh, typically at least three, um, is something that you can uh, determine and quantify the drift yourself. Here's a simple uh, sample budget for basically a temperature calibration, i.e. calibrating thermometers in a liquid bath. So, uh, of course, we have the, uh, the, the big three here. We have the drift and the reference. One other thing we have that uniformity or homogeneity uh, of the uh, the bath. Uh, it might not be completely uniform throughout the uh, entire uh, temperature bath. So those of you all that are involved in testing, uh, typically the way I like to explain it is you're, 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 you don't escape uncertainty typically. There might be some agent some areas that uh, will require you to do a rigid uh, combining, quantified, uh, uh, and expanding your uncertainty like in calibration labs. Uh, I took this excerpt from PL3, uh, which sort of, it correlates uh, pretty much verbatim to what's in 17025. So for testing organization, the rigorous mathematical and statistical estimate of the measurement uncertainty may not be possible. So the requirements of ISO 17025, 2005, 5462 uh, would apply. In such cases, the organization must identify all the components of uncertainty and make a, and I highlighted the word reasonable. So if I'm doing looking at a testing lab, typically I'm, if, uh, I'm looking at at least a reasonable estimation of uncertainty. Um, the reasonable estimation is to be based on the knowledge of the performance of the method and on the measurement. It's also uh, shall make use of, for example, 
previous experience of validation data. This is especially applicable to the biological, chemical, environmental, and sensory evaluation field. The estimation can be based on standards or methods such as ASTM E2554-13 using verification of quality control data. Also, in those cases where a rail recognized test method specifies the limits to the value of the measure of the uh, major sources of uncertainty of measurement, it specifies the form of presentation of calculated results. The laboratory is considered to have satisfied this clause by following the test method and reporting instructions, which is included in ISO 1705. To five, uh, note number two. These considerations would also apply to the main producers of reference materials and reference uh, uh, and certified reference material as, requ as required by ISO Guide 34. General requirements for the competence of reference material producers. Okay, I want to wrap things up here by looking ahead. So uh, uh, I mentioned the standard is going to be revised. It looks like we're going to have a 17025 2017. Uh, so it's going to, a new term is going to be in that uh, standard. It's going to be uh, the decision rule. And it's just the term is new. It's really been included all along. Uh, decision rule is the rule that describes how measurement uncertainty is accounted for. When making state, when stating conformity with a spe, with a specified requirement. So again, pass fail intolerance, allotolerance, those sort of things. We have to have a decision rule, basically state, stating how we took measurement uncertainty into account. By making the statement that a measurement is in compliance with an identifiable identified, identified metrological specifications or clauses thereof, the calibration organization is required current, uh, currently through uh, 510.14.2 to have accounted for the associated uncertainty of the measurement in reaching its decision. Okay, so what I try to do here is depict uh, what, what we're referring to with a decision rule and taking measurement uncertainty into account. So here we have four values. Uh, down the bottom there, we have a value that USL is upper spec limit. So that's what we're basing our pass, uh, our pass fail with tolerance out of tolerance. So here we clearly have a value and the degree of uncertainty that falls within uh, the passing um, limit. So we can clearly say pass fail. Category number two is we have a value. The value falls within the pass. However, the if we take uncertainty into account, it may not actually pass. It actually goes above. The uncertainty will take it above the uh, specifications limit. So we can't say with complete certainty uh, or based on our uh, expanded cave coverage factor whether or not that's at the pass or fail. And excuse me, the next. Uh, the next one up the board there should actually be category three. Looks like I got two category twos here. Uh, here we have a value that clearly fails. However, take a measurement on certainty into account. Uh, it may not actually fail. You can see the uh, uncertainty limits uh, go uh, uh, into the uh, below the uh, upper spec limit. Uh, and then uh, the one up on the top, category four. That's clearly a fail. Both the values take a measurement on certainty into account. That is above the uh, specification limits. Hence, uh, we can say we take a measurement on certainty into account that that's a failure. The decision rule is going to come into place in a couple different uh, uh, parts of the revised standard. And one of them is in review request tenders and contracts. So when the customer requests a statement of conformity to a specification or standard of a, a test or calibration, i.e. pass, fail, and tolerance out, the specification of the standard and the decision rule shall clearly be defined unless inherited in the uh, requested 
specification of the standard. The decision rule selected shall be communicated to and agreed to with the customer. So at the front end here, this is saying uh, we have to identify the decision rule. And when uh, another thing that's uh, going to be apparent much more in the uh, new standard is the uh, risk management. So uh, when a uh, customer is uh, looking at the at this at a, at, a, at a lab, basically you're looking at how much risk of a false acceptance is the customer willing to take. Uh, And then at the back end, uh, when we're reporting the results, when a conformity, when a statement of conformity to a specification or standard is provided, the laboratory shall document the decision rule applied, taking into the county and level of risk, such as a false accept and a false re reject and statistical assumptions uh, associated with the decision rule uh, employed and applied the decision rule. So during contract review, we have to define the decision rule, and we also are going to have to be reporting it. Uh, one thing I, I put up here is there's going to be an actual section in the uh, revised standard in regards to uncertainty. So what I have there are two excerpts out of the uh, the final draft, uh, and what what I have at the bottom there is what we're currently used to see it. I, I sort of touched on this some at the beginning. Uh, the laboratory shall identify the contributors to measurement uncertainty when evaluating measurement uncertainty. All contributors, which are significant, including those arising from samples, shall be taken into account using the appropriate method of analysis. A laboratory before calibration including of its own equipment shall evaluate the measurement uncertainty uh, for all calibration. So one thing that's missing there, that's not going to go forward. And again, this is more because uh, back in 2005, we were still uh, uh, paper-based. Uh, we're more electronic now. That uh, not so much uh, we're going to be looking for. Of course, if you have it, you can still utilize it. Uh, uh, an actual procedure. So basically, uh, currently under 2005, we're looking for a lab to have a procedure and apply a procedure. So uh, a little bit of uh, uh, differences there from 2005 and moving forward in 2017. Okay, uh, that brings us to the end of the presentation. Uh, this time is allocated for questions. So you should have a, a space uh, provided uh, uh, on your screen there for submitting questions. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, to submit them. Uh, I'll give you about five minutes time. Those questions will be relayed to myself and I'll try to attempt to, uh, to answer uh, as many as possible. If for whatever reason, a question remains unanswered, or perhaps after we sign off this afternoon, something comes to mind, you can still submit a question to that address we have, it'll have uh, on the screen. Webinars at pjlabs.com. So I'm going to uh, uh, be quiet here for a little bit and uh, give you five minutes and uh, see what type of questions we get concerning today's uh, presentation.
Okay, uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, I have a few questions here. Uh, before I move on, I just want to pull up this screen. We already have our uh, next webinar scheduled. You can see uh, coming up next month, December 19th, uh, believe it or not. Uh, years, years flown by here. So, uh, and actually, uh, by this time, uh, um, December 19th, we may actually have the new standard uh, to uh, to report on. So uh, we uh, we do have currently uh, Section 5.2 personnel requirements. Um, and of course, if the standard is revised, we will definitely be taking a look at the uh, the new standard and personnel requirements, along with the uh, 2005 requirements, which uh, leads me right into my question one, which is uh, uh, ISO 17025. When will the new revision be released? And I got it on fairly fairly good terms. It may be as soon as uh, soon as uh, by the end of November. But uh, definitely, it looks like it's going to be in 2017. Also, uh, with PJLA, and a question that always comes up, and the other accrediting body, it's going to be a three-year transition period involved in that. So you can uh, st still stay accredited in 2005 for up to three years. Um, however, um, after the three-year period, uh, um, I like will not recognize that anymore. Hence, everybody who is accredited will have to come up to speed on the 2005. And a couple of these questions, you have to excuse me, I'm a, a calibration person. I'm not uh, that versed in all the testing. So I'm going to try to answer this next one uh, to the best of my uh, capabilities. Uh, uh, we are a tier one test lab for automotives, IEMs. You have specific test specifications that we follow. We do not calibrate any of our equipment. What type of uncertainty examples can you give me as a reference? I tend to think this does not apply to us. When I worked at a, a different tier one, that was ISO 1702-5000, accredited, we did uh, not have to do uncertainties for any of the tests uh, performed. Uh, we were testing for GM, uh, Toyota, Hyundai, and uh, BMW specs. Uh, typically with testing labs, if I have had to uh, specify what type of analysis I have seen and what is used uh, is typically based on repeatability, repeatability of performing the test, i.e. collecting that standard deviation. Um, if you recall, we went over the, uh, the uh, you may not have to do uncertainty in the past because your, your adopted procedure may have uh, addressed it, where if your uh, test method uh, basically it, identifies the contributors to uncertainty and give uh, uh, limits as far as, let's say, accuracy requirements. Uh, let's say for a scale, for example, if you're a manufacturer, you have to use a scale within one yeah, that uh, is accurate to within one pound would be an example. Uh, that would, uh, uh, of course, uh, would be uh, looked at as a contributor, and that's an example of where it's uh, specifying those limits. Uh, so uh, again, uh, with testing, as far as doing actual uncertainty, I can tell you that, that more, more times than not, I've seen that just based purely on repeatability. Oops, excuse me. And uh, this, this next one is, and I'll give you my take on it. I, I may be looking at it, this is in the wrong way. What is the difference between measurement uncertainty and measurement system analysis? Uh, what would you need to do one versus the other? Uh, measurement system analysis, I would say you're, you're doing that when you're basically validating your system as far as the intended use, i.e. validating that uh, you're able to meet those uncertainties. Um, Let's say, for example, a proficiency test could be a, a form of measurement system analysis. Do I have any suggestions for sources to provide examples for test and determination of measurement uncertainties? Again, um, 
I know, and, and I don't have the numbers right here at the top of my head, but if you go on to ILAC or APLAC, A-P-L-A-C, um, websites, they have some guidance documents. I know APLAC has, a, has one pertaining to um, uh, uncertainty and testing. I'm not sure we may even have that addressed on PJLA's website. Uh, we have some resource resources on our website that uh, that um, are uh, uh, there for your use. So uh, I'm not real sure if we uh, if we have any specifically related to uh, to testing. I'm thinking that we do. If not, I would recommend ILAC or the APLAC uh, website as far as their guidance documents. Okay, uh, I believe that's it. Uh, I hope I answered all your questions sufficiently. If I misinterpreted, misinterpreted your, your questions, feel free to resubmit them on uh, that uh, website, that uh, web address right there. Um, particularly those that were interested in testing, um, I could uh, look that up real easy as far as uh, um, resources and give you specific uh, document numbers on that. Uh, again, uh, this will bring a close to November's uh, webinar. Uh, thank you all for joining us. We look forward to, to you all logging back in in December. And uh, like I said, uh, we got personnel on tap. And I can tell you that's one of the, the sections that's uh, uh, there's going to be some scale down as far as the, repet the repetitiveness of the requirements in uh, 2017 as specified in 2005. So uh, wish everybody a uh, happy Thanksgiving, and uh, we'll uh, see you all again in December. Thank you.